Now, one idea that we've learned about Daniel's book in that, uh, is that the, uh, the central idea or the recurring idea is the rise and fall of four great earthly kingdoms which are then permanently replaced by God's kingdom. If you keep your eye on that idea, then all of it makes sense, okay? Uh, the original vision, of course, um, of, the, um, of the great statue contained in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, uh, that kicks everything off. You know, so Nebuchadnezzar has the dream of the great statue. We said before that the great statue is representative of you know, different, different uh, nations. The head of gold, Babylon, the, uh, the chest, the arms of silver, uh, the Medes and Persians, the brass hips, uh, of course the um, Greece, and then the legs of iron, feet of iron and clay of Rome. So those are the four nations he's talking about. Now in subsequent visions, Daniel is going to return to this prophecy and he's going to give more details about these kingdoms, but he uses different symbols to describe them. Okay? For example, the Medo-Persian Empire in the, in, the, in the king's dream is represented by you know, a chest of silver with two arms. You know, that's, that's, that's what represents the Medo-Persian Empire in the dream. In his first vision that he has, the same empire this time is represented by a bear who has ribs in his mouth. Okay? Different vision, but referring to the same empire. And then in his second vision, he sees again the Medo-Persian empire, but this time as a ram with two horns. So we get confused when we try to assign these visions to different things. It's always about the same thing, about these four kingdoms, okay? Uh, another example is um, the empire of Greece. In the original dream, the empire of Greece is represented by the belly and hips of brass in Nebuchadnezzar's original dream, but in the first vision that he has later on, this same kingdom is represented by a leopard with wings. And then in the second vision that he has, this same kingdom, Greece, is now represented by a he-goat with a horn, with one horn. And I told you last time, the reason for this is that the image of the statue um, is not complex enough to give all the details that Daniel wants to give about these four kingdoms. And so God gives him a vision of a, of a different image representing the same kingdom, but that vision contains more information symbolically about that particular vision, okay? So that was, if you weren't here last time, that's what we were talking about. Now as we move through a variety of images and symbols and characters, Let's always remember that he's always describing the rise and fall of these kingdoms and the eventual appearance of the kingdom of God that will supersede all of these kingdoms. That's what Daniel is all about. That's why it's such a powerful prophecy. There's so much detail concerning what would take place hundreds of years in the uh, in the future, that, you know, uh, at the time of Daniel, nobody would, could even conceive of a thing called the Roman Empire. They couldn't even conceive it. And yet, he gives so much detail in his visions about this particular empire. Okay, so now we move to the eighth chapter. Remember I told you, this is not a line by line study, but a kind of an overview. That's why I gave you that extra paperwork, because that extra paperwork gives you all the details line by line. So the eighth, the eighth chapter in his book describes in more detail the struggle for power between the second and the third kingdoms. That is the Medo-Persian kingdom and the kingdom of Greece. And these are presented as, first of all, a two-horned ram as the Medo-Persian empire with two horns representing its two nations, the Medes and the Persians, so a ram with two horns representing the two nations. 
and then a he goat with one horn and very swift, that represented the Greek empire, which was Alexander the Great. And it represented very well the Greek empire because uh, 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 of course, as I mentioned, Alexander so quickly dominated the world and there was only one leader and that was Alexander. One horn, one leader. So we see in the dream that the he-goat charges and destroys the ram, which describes exactly Greece's victory over the Medes, some 200 years before either nation confronted each other. So if you go to chapter eight, uh, verse eight, it says about this vision that he has, it says, then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly, but as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken, and in its place there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. So here he continues, in the vision that he sees, he continues interpreting the vision. And so here he prophesies about what happened uh, or what is going to happen after Alexander's death as four of his generals divide the kingdom and take control of it. So you know, the, the vision of the he-goat with one horn, that's the Greek empire led by Alexander the Great, one horn. But then he says, he sees in his vision, the horn is broken. Well, Alexander dies. And after he dies, it's, he says in a vision, four horns come out. Well, the four horns represent four generals. And that's historically correct. That's exactly what happened. I mean, 200 years into the future, that's what happened. Alexander dies, four of his generals rise up and take control of the empire. Now in verses nine to 27 of chapter eight, I'm not going to read it, but it describes the rise of a smaller horn which would attack God's people and blaspheme God. Now this prophecy can have secondary and final fulfillment. And I explained to you last time that prophecies can have primary, secondary, or final fulfillment. In other words, they can refer, let me just show you a thing. They can refer, when we say a primary fulfillment, that's something that Daniel, or any prophet, by the way, this same idea, but in this case, Daniel. Primary means that Daniel makes a prophecy of something that's going to happen in the future, but in the future where he's still alive. That's primary. It could be a year from now, a month, uh, three years, but it's while he's still alive. Secondary fulfillment is still in the future, but it's further into the future. So when Daniel prophesies about uh, uh, the Greek empire, that's, that's a secondary fulfillment. That's way ahead in the future, a couple of hundred years. And then there's a final fulfillment. And when we talk about prophecies that have a final fulfillment, we're talking about prophecies that only are fulfilled at the end of time. Okay? I want you to keep that in mind. So the fulfillment of this little horn, right? it says a little horn comes up all right, in his vision, can have, first of all, a secondary fulfillment. In other words, the prophecy about the little horn can be something that has, or was going to be something that will happen in the far future. Not at the end of the world, but at the far future. And this is a reference to the Syrian king, Antiochus Epiphanes, who attacked the Jews and desecrated the temple. He blasphemed God and he led uh, which led to the Maccabean, uh, Maccabean rather, uh, uprising. That happened in 170 AD. So that's several hundred years in the future. So Daniel sees this vision of a little horn that comes up that has eyes that, that, that blasphemes against God. And we're wondering, who's that person? Well, that prophecy is about this Syrian king. Not a world power, a, re, a little horn, a regional power. Um, uh, Syria, he was the king of the northern uh, country of Syria at the time. So Daniel is going to give more details about this person and time, but he's going to do it in chapter 11. That's why I broke everything down for you. It's kind of confusing you know, uh, the way that the thing is uh, laid out. Uh, but he's going to describe in chapter 11 regional wars between the Syrians in the north and Alexander's general, one of his generals controlled Egypt and Palestine uh, in the south. And so, just to get it straight, he makes prophecies that are going to talk about the four great world powers that are to come. Well, three to come, because he was living during the Babylonian, okay? 
And then he, he kind of breaks down and he talks about the struggle between the second and third great powers. And then he breaks it down even more and talks about what takes place in between these two powers. Okay? And that's the, that, that little horn there. He's going to talk about what happens regionally. So that's a secondary fulfillment. Um, and, and that would find itself in the historical, um, the historical time of Antiochus Epiphanes 170 BC. Now that same prophecy about the little horn and the blasphemy and stuff like that, that can also have a final fulfillment. And that final fulfillment at the end of time would look something like this. It would be a reference to point to the end of time when a person in the likeness of Antiochus Epiphanes will come to blaspheme God and turn people away from God. This, we wouldn't call him the little horn, we would call him the Antichrist. And so this prophecy could either have a secondary fulfillment in a king, a local king, who was blasphemous and caused the Jews a lot of problems, or it could also refer to a final fulfillment um, in an individual uh, who uh, acted like this king, but at the end of time, which Paul refers to as the Antichrist. Okay, you with me? Huh? Good. All right, we'll keep going. So we know that Daniel's reference to the little horn is already fulfilled in Antiochus Epiphanes some 400 years later, but scholars still debate if this prophecy was meant to refer to the Antichrist as well. Okay? A complex idea, hopefully, between the paperwork and the, and the, the slides and your, uh, your notes you yeah, will we'll grasp. All right, let's get on to chapter nine. He talks about the 70 weeks. Let's talk about that. In chapter nine, Daniel prophesies concerning the nation of Israel and the specific coming of the Messiah. So we, we change gears in chapter nine. He's not talking about the kingdoms now. Now he's going to talk about the coming of the Messiah. Daniel uses the idea of 70 weeks to give the exact time when certain things will take place in the future. So in chapter nine, verses one to 19, again, we don't have time to read, I just have to summarize it. In verses one to 19, Daniel is praying and he's studying the word when all of a sudden he realizes that Jeremiah's prophecy said that the people would be in captivity for 70 years and he realizes that, that that 70 years is almost up in his own lifetime. And so he prays that God will honor his word and return the people home in order to rebuild the city of Jerusalem and the temple. That's what chapter nine is about. So we pick up the story in verse 20 of chapter nine. He says, now while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord. Now his supplication was, please God, you know, return the people, the time is over. You promised after 70 years they could go back. That's the supplication, all right? So supplication before the Lord my God on behalf of the holy mountain of my God. While I was still speaking in prayer, then the man, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness about the evening, um, about the evening offering. Gabriel is the angel, he calls him the man because the angel appeared as a man. He gave me instruction and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued, and I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed, so give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up, the, uh, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat even in the times of distress. 
Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing, and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with the flood. Even to the end there will be war, desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering, and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Well, that's pretty clear. I don't think we need to, any explanations there, do we? <laughs> so what happens here? God gives Daniel further understanding concerning the history and the future of the restored city, Jerusalem, and the time of the arrival of the promised Messiah. So he's talking about two things. When will the city be rebuilt? And when will the Messiah come? The information is tied up in the expression 70 weeks. From their perspective, they could not solve this numerical mystery, but from our viewpoint, we can get a clearer understanding. You know, from where they stood, they, they didn't get what the 70 weeks meant, but we do. We, we have some insight towards it. What the 70 uh, weeks exactly referred to depends on how you begin counting and where you begin counting. I'll give you a little example here. A lot of scholars think that the 70 weeks refers to 70 weeks of years. Okay? The number seven uh, in uh, Jewish numerology was used in significant ways from the very beginning of scriptures. In other words, numbers were very meaningful. The number seven, of course, used in the days of creation. Uh, 70 years of captivity. It was a combination of two other numbers. The number four, which represented the world. North, south, east, west. The number four represented the world. The number three represented God. And so the combination of four, the world, and God, uh, in other words, God and His creation. I mean, everything that exists is God and His creation. And so the number seven really referred to a perfect union, something which was perfect. And so 70 weeks, or 70 times seven, all right, seven days in a week, uh, equaled 490 years. Keep that in mind. This idea comes, this idea of 70 weeks equals 490 years, how do they figure that out? How, did, how do they know that's what it means? Well, the idea comes from Ezekiel in chapter four, verse six, where Ezekiel assigns one year for each day in a certain prophecy. And so you need to be careful because there's nothing that tells us that the equation in Ezekiel's prophecy should be applied to Daniel's prophecy. It's just speculation. If they used it there, you know, uh, uh, the weeks refer to years, maybe that's what they mean in Daniel's prophecy as well. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. The significance of the prophecy is that it refers to periods of time where certain things would happen. That's the idea. Daniel divided the seven weeks into three parts. Seven weeks, 62 weeks, one week. These refer to the following events. Let me give you a thing there. First of all, the first one is how long it would take to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. That's what he's referring to. That's what his prophecy is about. And so it's from, from the time Daniel is there to the building of the temple, how long would that be? Seven weeks. Now remember what they refer to. Then the next one would be how long it would be until the Messiah would come. In other words, from Daniel to the rebuilding of the temple, one period of time. Then from the rebuilding of the temple to when the Messiah would come. That's a second period of time. And then the third period of time, how long after the Messiah would come would be the end of his ministry and the end of the nation. In other words, watch, from Daniel to the rebuilding of the temple, then from the rebuilding of the temple to the coming of the Messiah, then from the coming of the Messiah 
to the destruction of the temple and the nation of Israel. That's what he's projecting ahead. And all of that information is tied up in these, this idea of 70, 70 weeks. Let's face it, these were three main events in Jewish history that were left to happen. Everything else had happened up until that time. They were freed you know, from, from Egypt and they, they, they settled the land, they, they went into the promised land and, the, you know, and there were the kings and so, so a lot of things had already happened in their history. There were three major things still to happen. The rebuilding of the temple and the restoration of the nation, the coming of the Messiah, that was the second thing, and then the third thing would be the ultimate destruction of the nation of Israel and the temple. Those were the three things left. That's, what, that's why I say Daniel's prophecies are so amazing in what he, what he says. Now scholars have tried to compute numbers to correspond exactly you know, to the day with various historical events, but of course they're not in agreement. However, if we approach these um, numbers as representing general eras, then we have a better chance at understanding. Not nailing it down to the day and the, and the moment, but rather in this period of time, that's going to happen. And then in this period of time, that's going to happen, and so on and so forth. Let me give you an example of that. And so from the time Daniel made the prophecy to the temple's completion, historically we know, was about 50 years. Well, he says seven weeks, seven times seven, 49 years. You see what I'm saying? Some say, oh, well, that's not 50 years. Well, that's not the point. The point was, in how much time is this going to happen? Well, he says seven times seven, you know, seven weeks, seven times seven, 49 years. Well, it happened in about 50 years. Okay. Then, from the time that Daniel made the prophecy to the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, how long would that be from Daniel to the coming of the Messiah? Well, approximately five centuries. Well, 62 weeks. You know, he said seven, 62. Well, what's 62 times seven? 434 years. So approximately five centuries. You know, during what era would the Messiah come? Well, he says, 62 weeks, 434 years. When did He come? Well, roughly 500 years. And then from the time of the Messiah's coming to the end of His ministry and death on the cross and then ultimately the destruction of Jerusalem, how long was that period? Well, from 30 right, to 70. Jesus died you know, 30 AD roughly. And when, were, when was Jerusalem destroyed? Well, we know, 70 AD, the Romans came, destroyed it. Well, how long is that? 40 years. Well, 40 years, one week, a short period. So you have a medium period, that's when the temple will be rebuilt, a very long period, that's when the Messiah will come, and then a very, very short period. Okay, seven, 62, one. Okay, so you have to remember when dealing with numbers, the prophets were more interested with acts and events and sequence and eras. Um, so the numbers indicated how many acts and the era and the place and the sequence, but not necessarily exact to the day. They were less concerned with the numerical exactness, more concerned with the events and the epochs in time. Jeremiah, the one, the one exception to that, which I think proves the rule, is Jeremiah. He prophesied exactly 70 years for the captivity, and, uh, and after 70 years they did come back. Daniel picks up on that symbolic number of 70 weeks and foretells the last three main events that would take place in the life of uh, the Jewish nation. Okay, so there's chapter nine. Chapter 10, chapter 10 we have angels. In verses one to nine of chapter 10, Daniel tells of a troubling period in his soul when he sees and has an exchange with an unnamed angel. In verses 10 to 21 of that chapter, the angel reveals to Daniel some of the struggles that take place in the unseen realm of the spiritual world. And if you've read the chapter, you see that the struggle is between angelic beings in the control and the movement of nations in that period of time. Fascinating, fascinating reading. 
Again, Daniel is describing events that are related to these four kingdoms, but this time from a kind of behind the scenes point of view. In other words, we've seen the four kingdoms, they rise, they fall, the kings, some of the intrigue between the, you know, the, the various kingdoms. Now he talks about what's happening in the spiritual realm while these kingdoms are rising and falling. And so Angel, in this chapter, reveals the following. First of all, he reveals that his mission is to give Daniel yet another vision concerning his people and what would happen to them in the future. And this vision will unfold in chapter 11. We'll touch on that in a minute. Then the second thing, he reveals the angelic struggle between himself and other angels that guide or empower the nations that Daniel has spoken of in his vision. So Daniel's spoken of the Medo-Persian Empire, well, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Greek, the Roman, and now the angel comes and tells him what is happening behind the scenes, what's happening in the spiritual world that is making these kingdoms rise and fall. So the angel tells him that he and Michael, the archangel, were struggling with the angel who was over Persia in preparation for the coming of the angel from Greece. I mean, I don't know what that means. It's just so fascinating. This describes the future struggle between Persia and Greece. Now, we don't understand the nature of the struggle between the angelic beings. I mean, perhaps the angel over Persia was refusing to accept the demise of his protectorate and these other angels were there to prepare for the eventual destruction of that protectorate by Greece. Who knows what's going on? Daniel sort of opens that curtain a little bit and then closes it. In any event, the revelation shows Daniel that the order of world events is controlled by God and worked out by His messengers. Fascinating thing indeed, especially when you think about what's going on in our world today. All right, so we go to chapter 11. And here he talks about, uh, you know, we've had the big picture, the panoramic picture. Okay, of uh, you know, the, the four great world empires over a period of four or five hundred years. Now what he does is he telescopes in to, uh, 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 you know, to events that take place in, 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 uh, you know, in between these kingdoms. Okay? So in the chapter he's going to see a vision that introduces some new elements to the scenario of the four kingdoms. Let me give you a little bit of background here so you'll understand. After the death of Alexander the Great, <clears throat> as I said, his kingdom was divided among his four generals. One general, Ptolemy Soter, was the general who received the land of Egypt and he then annexed Judea as part of his domain. And this activity took place between 324 and 264 BC. The Greek Empire was still the dominant force, but it was beginning its decline after the death of uh, Alexander. So this kingdom here, you know, uh, Egypt with Judea annexed to it, was threatened in a regional war by a powerful northern country called Syria, who contested the annexation of the Judean territory, and thus began a series of conflicts between the northern kings in Syria and the southern kings who were actually Greek rulers in the area of the Greek empire of Egypt. And the reason that they wanted this land is they wanted this land as a buffer. They wanted to control this land as a protection. The north wanted it as a protection from the south. The south wanted it as a protection from the north. They each wanted it as a staging area to launch wars against each other and also for the natural resources there and the food and so on and so forth. So there was continually a war, but it was a regional war. It wasn't a world war, okay? Eventually, Syria dominated the area and that took place between 204 BC to about 165. They, 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 they eventually got the upper hand. They were the stronger of the two nations. Meanwhile, in Jerusalem, something else is taking place that you need to understand. The Syrian domination of their country during that time 
there was a struggle going on in Jerusalem between the Orthodox Jews, the Jews who held very tightly to the word of God, they didn't want to make any changes, they wanted to make sure that Greek influence did not influence you know, the scriptures themselves. In other words, the Orthodox were the ones who were conservative. They were very careful in preserving the scriptures. They would even say, we do Bible things in Bible ways. Okay? <laughs> that was them. And they were fighting a battle against the liberals or the more worldly minded Jews that lived and who had been influenced tremendously by Greek ideas and Greek philosophy. So there was this local battle going on between these two. And I might open a little parenthetical statement here. If you ever wonder, where do the Pharisees come from? Well, the Pharisees come from this period of time. The, 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 the party of the Pharisees began at around this time. They were the ones who were, um, who were standing up to make sure to preserve the integrity of the Hebrew scriptures. And they were, believe it or not, they were the heroes of the time. They were the heroes of that period. We know, however, when we study the New Testament, that by the time of the New Testament, these same Pharisees and heroes had become, well, we knew what they became, right? They, they began to add to God's word. They, they did exactly the thing that they were trying to defend uh, in the beginning. Okay, that little parenthetical statement, let's close that, just a little historical note. Now, these two factions in Jerusalem constantly fought over who would control the high priest office, um, which was the most powerful position in Jerusalem. Now, to make matters more complicated, the high priest office at the time was appointed by the Syrian king as a sort of a governor under Syrian control. Uh, there was a lot of lobbying by both sides to influence the Syrian king to appoint the proper candidate. During the reign of one particularly nasty pagan king, the aforementioned Antiochus Epiphanes, the high priest office was actually sold to the highest bidder. Well, on one occasion, Antiochus appointed a high priest and he sent him to Jerusalem where he was immediately rejected by the local Orthodox leader and they ran him out of town. And so Antiochus was furious and he came with his army into Jerusalem. He murdered thousands. He tore down the walls. He forbade circumcision on pain of death. And worst of all, he erected a statue of the pagan god Olympias in the temple and then he sacrificed a pig on the altar in the temple. In other words, he completely desecrated the temple and the holy place and the place where Jews can worship and uh, uh, made a law that you were not allowed to be circumcised. Okay, well of course this caused a revolt among the people and a guerrilla type war uh, ensued and that group, the guerrilla leader, was led by a man named Judas Mattathias, but his name in Greek was Judas Maccabee. You ever hear of the Maccabean revolt? That's where that started. This took place between 165 and 163 BC. Anyways, make a long story short, after a long struggle, the Syrian king actually was forced to sign a peace treaty and the temple was cleansed and worship was once again renewed and this rededication of the temple has been memorialized by the Jews in a holiday that they still celebrate today and it's called Hanukkah. And that's what Hanukkah is. It's a, mem a, 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 a remembrance of the rededication of the temple after it had been desecrated. And so for about a hundred years, the Jews enjoyed a relative amount of freedom and peace after that war. Now in 145 BC, Rome eventually defeated Greece and began to tighten its grip on world power. In 63 BC, it captured Jerusalem and it subdued all the local kings under its control. Rome then put local rulers to govern the area and at the time of Jesus' birth, Herod was one of those that Rome had appointed as ruler. Okay, so when we look at the rise and fall of the four great kingdoms, 
What I've described to you is what took place in the area of Judea between the fall and the rise of the third and fourth kingdom. In other words, as the Greek kingdom was descending and the Roman kingdom was ascending, there was this little war, this little regional war that took place between Syria and the south. And that's what Paul, uh, Paul that's what uh, Daniel is talking about here in chapter 11. And we get confused if we try to apply these symbols to the big powers. They're not. They're, they're, he's talking about a regional war. And so Daniel's vision is a close-up view of what will take place in Israel at the period where the Greek Empire is in decline and the Roman Empire is ascending. And I want to you know, emphasize the idea. Imagine, this is centuries into the future and God is giving Daniel these little details about what's taking place in this little regional war, simply to affirm the fact that this is prophecy, historically confirmed. And so chapter 11 is a detailed account of the kings, the wars, and the outcome of this period. Now, the outline that I've given you explains this in detail, verse by verse, because obviously we don't have time in this class. You need to look at it yourself. Anyways, as far as the, I want to explain one other thing there. On the left of the page of your notes, uh, the verse is printed you know, for whatever chapter you're looking at. And then on the right is the interpretation agreed upon by most scholars. Now by verse 36 of chapter 11 and into chapter 12, you begin to have three interpretation of the verses that I have noted for you. And there are reasons for this. Some scholars think that there's a secondary and a final fulfillment of these words. So words refer to the same idea that repeats itself in the future and then once again at the end of the world. Remember I explained that to you. Some scholars think secondary fulfillment, end time fulfillment. So in verse 36, for example, it can refer only to Antiochus and his deeds, or it could also refer to the Antichrist at the end of the world, or both. So this list gives you the generally agreed interpretations, plus at times the varied ideas of other scholars, and I've chosen three Pretty main, you know, mainstream guys. One is Jim McGuigan, who's a member of the church, of course. I think most of us have heard of Jimmy McGuigan, a great preacher and a scholar. Um, the other is Butler. He's an evangelical scholar, but a conservative evangelical scholar. And then Young, if you know, he's the guy, you know, Young's Concordance, that, that Young, okay? So you get three, you were adults. You know, we need to put, put on our big boy reading glasses here and realize that you know, uh, in the Bible sometimes we're not exactly sure how something should be applied. There can be a, very, a, a, a variety of ways, especially when we're trying to interpret prophecy and visions. You know? It's not like you know, in the book of Acts, you know, Peter says, be baptized. Well, there's no vision there. It's pretty straightforward, but here we have visions. So I wanted to give you a little view of that. All right, chapter 12. Chapter 12, the time of the end. So Daniel continues his dialogue with the angel as the angel sweeps forward now to the outcome of the troubles that will take place now at the end of time. So the angel's given him a vision of this regional war that'll take place in the far future, three, four hundred years in the future. Now in verse 12, the, the, we go forward to the final. That's the image that he's going to get now. The last chapter, you know, verse 11, it spoke of the battle between Persia and Greece and then the local battles in Palestine until the appearance and dominance of the Roman Empire. But in the last chapter, we fast forward to look at the outcome of the struggle between the fourth kingdom, which is Rome, and the kingdom that will replace all the other kingdoms before it, and that is the kingdom of God. There we go. Note that he's still talking about the four kingdom and God's final kingdom, but again in a different way. I told you at the beginning, keep your eye on the ball. He's always talking about the same thing. And here he's talking about not Babylon, not Medo-Persia, 
not Greece, he's talking about the Roman Empire and what is going to happen at the very, very end. Now there are some features in verse 12 that you need to be aware of. First of all, he, he changes, no more 70 weeks, now he changes expressions. Now it's time, times, and half a time, and numbers to determine time when certain events will take place, especially the end of Jerusalem in the world. Another thing is he expresses uh, the promise that God will rescue those written in his book, the chosen ones. He also predicts a time of hardship and eventual punishment. And then Daniel has the vision to predict events, but the time is hidden or closed to him and us. Many have tried to guess it. You know, whenever you get a, a, you know, something on the internet or a flyer or something like that that tells you, okay, somebody uh, knows. <laughs> Somebody has figured it out and knows how to read the prophecies to give the exact time. You know, 2016, you know, well, the moment he says he knows, you, know, you get off that boat, okay? get off that train. Jesus himself said, no one knows, only the Father knows. All right? Again, there are different interpretations depending on the way you think the prophecies concern only a future event or perhaps deal exclusively with the end of time or both. So you, know, you may have different viewpoints, but the sequence is always the same, right? The sequence is always the same. The rise and the fall of the fourth kingdom, the persecution of God's people, perseverance and victory of God's people, the defeat and the judgment and the disappearance of the fourth kingdom, and then the reward and the happiness for God's people in the end. So you know, we may not agree as to how much time in between these particular events take place, but we know that that is the sequence of events. We know once the fourth kingdom shows up, then the kingdom of God shows up. And once the fourth kingdom falls and the kingdom of God begins to grow, we know there won't be any other kingdoms, only the kingdom of God will be there. And we also know that the kingdom of God will bring the reward to all those who believe. So that, sake, that sequence there is there. He also talks about time, times, and half a time. Notice the same sequence. He just uses a different expression. Before he said seven weeks, 60, you know, seven weeks, 62 weeks, one week. So in chapter 12 he talks about you know, uh, time, times, half a time. Same idea, same distance between the events uh, that will take place. So something to remember about Daniel's book. Remember we said Daniel and Revelation for beginners. The idea is we're doing a survey to understand, you know, the grasp, the, the notion of the book, the main ideas of the book. So some things we need to remember. First of all, it deals with four world powers and the church. Secondly, it describes the rise and fall of these and the eventual establishment of the church in a variety of ways and symbols and images. But it repeats the same story over and over again. It's always the same story. Number three, it's important to remember the sequence of events in chapter two, which remains the same even though the symbolism is at times hard to understand or match exactly to precise historical dates. Okay, remember that. Uh, a couple of other things we need to remember. Prophecy cons is concerned with events and epochs and sequence. Uh, exact numbers and days are used symbolically. So when you're trying to figure out, you know, oh, it's 464, well, uh, you know, in September, you, know, you were off by three and two thirds year and six hours, no. The prophets did not use numbers in that way. It's not engineering, it's prophecy. Okay? We have to understand, they're interested in sequence, epochs. Remember John the Baptist? John the Baptist, you know, he knew he was, the, he was the one announcing the coming of Jesus. He knew what his job was. And he knew, he saw Jesus do the miracles and so on and so forth. You know, he, he got the sequence right. But then, when the end of the world wasn't happening right away, which he thought, 
he sent out to Jesus and said, look, are you the one we should be looking for? Have I made a mistake here? What happened to the end of the world when Israel, you know, the, we, 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 uh, we rise up? What was John the Baptist's problem? He had the sequence right. He just didn't have the timing right. He thought it was going to happen in a couple of years, not in a couple of centuries or millennia. All right, so it's important for us to do that. Also, the sequence has been proven historically. That's very important. The sequence has been proven historically, and I repeat it again. Somebody say, why do you believe the Bible is inspired by God? Because of the fulfilled prophecy, especially the detail of fulfilled prophecy that we have in Daniel. And of course, um, uh, much of what he says, we're waiting for the final fulfillment uh, at the end of time, which could, could be any time. Remember that Jesus said things are going to go on just as they normally are. People are getting married, given in marriage, we're building, we're doing this, we're having children, and all of a sudden, before we know it, boom, it's the end. And it's not a thousand years and then we're going to have a, a second chance, no, no. When Paul says, in the twinkling of an eye, everything that happens at the end of the world happens in the twinkling of an eye. That Jesus come, that the dead are raised, that the, the, the saints are gathered with Him, that the evil ones are judged and punished, that Satan goes into uh, to, to, to the pit forever, that the heavens and earth are, are, are destroyed, that the new heavens and earth appear. All of that, twinkling of an eye. It's not, okay, well, we got the new heavens and the earth, you need to be patient, we're going to take a couple of centuries to get that going, you know? No, no, in the twinkling of an eye, everything happens, okay? So that's why the message of be ready is so important, because there's no time to change my mind, do what I was supposed to do, whatever. That's the lesson. And of course, uh, in Daniel, the great lesson at the end is we win. We're the winners at the end. Let's not be overwhelmed by taking place in the world at this time. It's always going to go on until the end of time. Okay, so we've completed Daniel, and we're going to head into Revelation in our next lesson. Thank you for your attention.